She's the North Coast Area IPM Advisor, and she serves Napa, Sonoma, Lake, and Mendocino counties. And today's topic is spotted lanternfly. So just a few quick things. If you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand, and there's two ways to do that. You can raise your hand in front of the camera if you are if your version of Zoom allows you to do that. Otherwise, you can click on reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, on the reactions button and then the raise your hand button and you can raise your hand that way. And then we'll call on you and you can unmute and ask your question or you can also type your question in the chat and we can ask it for you. And we'd like to thank, first of all, Cindy Cron for sharing her time and expertise. And especially wanna thank her because um, she actually has a little bit of a cold and she's still still here pushing through. So we really appreciate her being here today. Uh, Caroline Bamforth for helping with logistics, like registration, answering questions, sending out the link again to several people, et cetera. Um, and of course, our extension partners um, without whom we wouldn't be able to put on these programs. We have a slide with our extension partners here and we really appreciate their support. So with that, we thank you for attending. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna send it over to David Block to introduce the speaker. Great, thanks, Karen. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank Karen and Caroline for organizing the program today. And uh, we're very, very happy to have our guest today, Cindy Cron. Cindy actually graduated from UC Davis where she received a uh, bachelor's in viticulture and analogy with a minor in agricultural pest management, and then continued on to get her PhD here in entomology. As an undergrad, Cindy worked with brown marmor marmorated stink bug and European grapevine moth in the quarantine facility here at Davis, and later in the field on Virginia creeper, western, uh, western grape and variegated leaf hoppers. Her dissertation, for her thesis, for her PhD, explored the biology and behavior of the three-cornered alfalfa hopper in California vineyards. After finishing her doctorate, Cindy took a position as a postdoctoral research entomologist with the USDA in Parlier, where she collaborated on developing a degree day model to time ground cover management to reduce alfalfa three-cornered alfalfa hopper populations and continued her work on broadening the list of non-reproductive cover crops for growers to use. In 2019, Cindy accepted the North Coast IPM advisor position covering the crops of grape, walnut, pear, and olive in Napa, Sonoma, Lake, and Mendocino counties. Her current work is with three-cornered alfalfa hopper, blue-green sharpshooters, Virginia creeper leaf hopper, olive fruit fly, brown marmorated stink bug, unknown flat-headed boar of pear, um, walnut husk fly, and coddling moth which is a lot. And we're very, very happy to have you here, Cindy. Uh, it's a pleasure. And so I'm going to turn it over to her. She's going to give uh, a talk that's going to uh, last probably about 15 minutes or so, give or take. And then uh, please feel free to start putting your questions in the chat. Uh, and afterwards, we're just going to open it up for the rest of the hour for you guys to ask whatever questions come to mind for Cindy. So thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yes, I am still a little bit <clears throat> at getting over that cold. I think that's been going around. Um, so hopefully I don't cough too much. <laughs> but um, thank you for the introduction. Today, I am going to be talking about spotted lanternfly, which is an invasive species. Um, very colorful, very pretty, um, in my opinion, being an entomologist, I get excited about insects. Um, so the plant, this is a plant hopper. It is a hemipteran, so it does have a piercing sucking mouth part similar to mealybugs and leaf hoppers. Um, it's able to, it's a phloem feeder, so it has piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, and it is native to Northern China. It's about an inch long. So this is a pretty large insect um, in comparison to some of the other insects that we deal with in the vineyard. Um, so egg messes, uh, have been thought to have arrived on a stone shipment in 2012, but the first time that it was discovered in the US was in Pennsylvania in 2014, and it was a reproducing population in a, in a forested area. 
and it has since been documented. This was an older slide. Um, and so I did uh, follow up recently to make sure that this was still current, that it was documented in 14 states, but unfortunately now it has moved to 18 states. Um, so this was at the end of December of 2023. I did get this um, verification from Cornell University that we are now finding populations in 18 states. And so I've highlighted those states and um, I, I wanna be clear that it's not in you know, the whole state. Sometimes it's only in one county that they found it so far, um, but this is the region that we are looking at that we are finding spotted lanternfly currently. And when you overlay that and you look at this next map of where it is predicted this insect will thrive and do really well, um, it sort of aligns with uh, where we're seeing it currently. The red regions are where it's high suitability. And as you can see, uh, going over to California, uh, you know, there we are. We, ha we have a large region of California that's suitable and part of that is because grapes are a large crop um, and grapes are one of their preferred hosts. You can also see up in, in uh, Washington, Oregon area, um, this is also too, would be considered a very suitable region for this insect to thrive. So uh, photos on the right, these photos are on grapevines and you can see the numbers and the concentration of this insect and how large um, they are. And this is again, photos from the East Coast. Um, the host range are, is about 103 plus uh, plant species that it's known to be able to feed on with at least 40 of those occurring in the US. The preferred host is Tree of Heaven, which is an invasive tree um, that we have here in California uh, and great finds and new, uh, res new, new findings from the East Coast also are listing black walnut and maple as one of their preferred hosts. So as we're learning, in a way, we're a little bit lucky that it's not here yet, that um, it's been in the US for 10 years and that you have Penn State and Cornell University that are dealing with it directly because it is in their state. We are learning from um, their experiences and their research um, that we are, will eventually be able to use if this in insect um, makes its way to California. So black walnut and maple are also now listed as a preferred host along with grapevines and tree of heaven. But there are a, a range of hosts and it do, this insect does move from host to host. Um, at different life stages, it's moving around feeding from different uh, plants. So we also are concerned about stone fruit, apple, cherry, blueberry, fig, hops, oak, birch, sycamore, ash, it goes on. Um, there are a wide range of, of hosts. So what that means is that no matter where this insect go, it will likely be able to find a food source. Um, having a wide range of hosts definitely uh, allows for this insect to proliferate. So it is found in um, agricultural areas, wooded and urban areas and moves in between um, these different environments to feed. You can um, potential to severely harm, okay, the grape industry, we already know that, but also orchard and logging industries are also in there and should be concerned about this insect arriving in California. It can aggregate in large numbers, as you can see the photo on the right. Those are all um, spotted lanternfly aggregated together on a tree. Um, it has been documented up to 400 spotted lanternflies have been found on one grapevine alone. So uh, large numbers also do aggregate on grapes. So the issue with this insect is that it can lower your crop yields, increase the production costs, uh, lower the cold hardiness for the following season. Uh, you can have a reduced or no return bloom or crop for the following season uh, when you have large numbers feeding the year prior. It can cause vine death, which very few things can cause vine death for grape vines and cause trade disruptions. Uh, so when we trade grapes and we try to ship our grapes to other countries that don't have this insect, uh, it can definitely affect um, the ability to export our grapes. So it produces a large amount of honeydew. And you can see the photo on the right, the, you know, it's a substrate for sooty mold to grow. And that would affect the quality <coughs> of the grapevines. 
So in 2021, in July, CDFA introduced, uh, established a quarantine to prohibit uh, spotted lanternfly from um, being brought into the state. Um, this again uh, prohibits the entry into California of spotted lanternfly, but also it's host in a variety of articles, including conveyances um, originating from areas in which spotted lanternfly are known to exist. Uh, and then we're going to go into the life cycle of this insect. So egg laying, we'll start at the top, is September to November. And then the eggs overwinter. So they overwinter as eggs, October to June. <coughs> they go through four immature stages, one, two, three, four. And that starts in May and goes up to September. And then the adults are going to be found between July and December. <coughs> so the photos here show spotted lantern eggs on the right. And the female will lay one to two egg masses. And here on the right, you see two egg masses of 30 to 50 eggs. And they're laid in um, successive rows. And then they're covered with this yellowish brown waxy deposit you see on the left hand side. And so it makes it a little bit camouflage, especially if it's say laid on a tree. Uh, it's harder to notice that there's actually an egg mass here. And eggs are laid on smooth tree surfaces, but also inanimate objects. And this is one of the issues with this insect because it's able to lay its uh, eggs on telephone poles, stones, pallets, outdoor furniture, railway cars, firewood, vehicles. Um, they've even been found on kiddie pools, things that you have outside in your yard that you're not even thinking about checking, you can lay, they can lay eggs on it. Um, and so being able to lay eggs on non-plant items contributes to spider lantern flies wide dispersal ability. Say you're family in Pennsylvania and you wanna to move to California and you're packing up your stuff you're not checking your lawn furniture for spotted lanternfly eggs. So the, the ability of this uh, insect to be able to be move long distances without being aware, it, it definitely um, makes it a larger problem. Um, most insects lay their eggs only on, on, on a host species, on a, where the, the immature stage, uh, stage will emerge and be able to feed right away. So the ability to be able to lay its eggs anywhere um, definitely contributes to its ability to disperse. So what are, what are we looking at? So I showed you what the eggs look like. Um, so we have four immature stages called instars. So instar is just a fancy word for immature stage. So you go from egg and you go one, two, three, and then four, and then an adult. And so the first through third instar are black. They're with white spots, very noticeable, very different from the insects that we have currently out in the field. Um, they're sort of waxy looking. Um, and then the fourth instar, they have white spots still and some black markings, but you do now see some red coloration uh, for the fourth, fourth instar. Again, these insects don't look like anything we have in the field currently. So when you're out there and you see something like this, it should click in your mind like, wow, this is different, what is this? Um, and these are some photos of what they look like congregated you know, on trees, uh, the different life stages. On the right-hand side, you see the eggs with the immature stages. And um, so this is what it would look like if you came across it, say in a wooded area um, or on another plant. So on the left-hand side, the adults are at rest. And when they're at rest, um, their hind wings, which you see on the right-hand side are the red, reddish rings with the black spots are covered. So when they're at rest, their four wings are over those red wings, which cause this little pinkish hue. But again, a very noticeable insect with black, you know, polka dots on it. And this reticulated uh, tips uh, of the wings. You don't normally see the hind wing, the red wing. Uh, they show that when they're about to fly, or if you, if they feel like they're being attacked, then they will you know, move their four wings forward and show you their red hind wings. Um, it is a defense mechanism, 
meant for uh, birds, any kind of insect that can see the color red. Uh, insects don't see the color red, but animals see the color red. Uh, so it's it's more of a warning of like, I'm untasty, don't eat me um, kind of thing. So if you want to uh, learn more about spotted lanternfly, uh, I do have a newsletter and it is in English and in Spanish. You can access it ucanr.edu forward slash NCIPM for North Coast IPM. Um, I also have an article on Tree of Heaven, which is one of its preferred hosts. Again, this is a downloadable PDF with mm, photos. And it's in English and in Spanish. And what's most important is report any sightings. Um, I cannot be out in the field all the time, but you guys are. Uh, so if you see anything that looks similar to this, the immature stages, the eggs, the adults, please uh, collect in a sealed container if at all possible, document the location and the dates where you found it, and then you, you can turn it into your local county agri agricultural commissioner or to your UC Cooperative Extension office. Um, and together with your help, we will be able to keep spotted lanternfly out of California. And with that, I'm done with my presentation part. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, that was very interesting and brilliant pictures. Uh, oh, yeah. I have to say, when you have like, it looks like hundreds on a tree, that's pretty intimidating. Um, right. So I just wanted to remind everybody listening that ask questions, you can raise your hand, you can put it in the chat and we will read the questions for you. But I'm going to start off with the first question to warm us up. So I, I sort of think I know this answer, but why is such a big deal made of, about invasive insect species? Mm. OK, so we have our native species that, of, of pest insects that co-evolve with their predators and their parasitoids. But when you have an invasive species, that means a species that um, is originally from another country or another region, when it's introduced, it's not introduced with its predators and its parasitoids typically. Um, and what that means is that when it arrives, our predators and parasitoids that we have here, which are different species, typically do not recognize it. They don't see it as prey. They don't see it as a host. Um, and therefore that population is able to reproduce and increase in numbers to the point in, in which it becomes an economic pest. Um, and in its native region, for instance, spotted lanternfly in China is not usually a problem because they have parasitoids that co-evolved with it. And it's very rare that it is a problem, and it has to do with all the situation, all of all you know that it is, is correct. Then it might become a pest for one season, uh, but it is not what we're seeing here in the U.S. And then it, then it comes down to you know nothing control, nothing's controlling it. You know, its parasitoids are back in China; they're not here, um, and so it just keeps reproducing makes a lot of sense yeah just uh, again uh, please feel free to put your questions in the uh, in the chat uh, there's a question in the chat and then we'll get to uh, Cliff in a second because he has his hand up the question in the chat is can the lantern fly feed on woody on the woody part of grapevines like the gra glassy wing sharpshooter so the first through third instar, so that's the first through third immature stage, um, are not known to feed on woody tissue. The fourth, is, the fourth instar, so the fourth immature stage, and the adults are and can. So it is that stage that you would be concerned with on feeding. Um, but that's just the woody tissue. If you have an immature stages on a grapevine, they can feed on your soft tissue, you know, your shoots um, and your green shoots. Uh, and so we think it has to do with um, the ability of its beak to penetrate into the plant material and it becomes sturdier as the insect gets larger. So when they're, they're a smaller insect, they're not able to penetrate as, as readily. 
But this insect does move between different hosts at different times of its life. Um, so great vines is a host that it tends to go to later, not earlier in, in, its, uh, in its life stage. <laughs> and Cindy, on the, on the East Coast, um, where this is already present, what, what crops are taking the biggest hit or just plants in general? So uh, what I've read so far, uh, obviously grapes and um, tree of heaven. Tree of heaven, they're not sure yet. Um, now it's an invasive, so it's not like we plant tree of heaven on purpose. It's not, um, and it's not for a crop. So um, we're not sure yet. They're not sure yet, the researchers on the East Coast, whether tree of heaven is required for this insect to complete its life cycle or not. There is still some questions as to whether that is. Um, but grapevines right now are the one that, you know, the one crop that's really seeing economic damage. Again, the crops that we have here in California aren't exactly the same crops that they have on the East Coast. So that's something to keep in mind too. It's hard to, we can try to predict what this insect's gonna do if it arrives, but it's hard to know until it does. Cliff, uh, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, Cindy, I gather there's no evidence of vectoring a virus because there's been a lot of work done so far. And if that's the case, why is that? Why doesn't it vector a virus? Yeah. So um, there's different types. Viruses interact with insects differently, depending on um, whether it's a circulative virus or whether it's a stylet-borne virus. And what, what that would mean was um, a virus that's circulative has to penetrate the gut wall of the insect and travel through the body cavity up into the salivary glands and penetrate that wall into the salivary glands to be transmitted. And that would be a circulative virus. But there has to be a receptor site for that virus that recognizes that virus and allows it to go across the gut wall. So. A lot of insects can ingest virus, but it doesn't actually have that receptor site to be able to let it move through the insect's body. Um, but there's also stylet borne viruses, viruses that would connect to a part of like the pre Siberium or Siberium area of the insect, which is like the pump right above the stylet. And then be able to, the insects, especially these insects, hemipterans, this family of insects, uh, sorry, this order of insects. They tend to put in their stylet, which is their mouth part, into the plant material. And then they salivate and regurgitate into that plant material. And that's how transmission, it'll break, you know, loose anything that's attached to that region if it's stylet born and then be injected into the plant. But also too, if it's circulative and it's made its way through the insect into the salivary glands, then it would be transmitted um, when that regurgitation and salivation happens. So that's a long answer to there, there is, there's relationships um, and there's not always that relationship present. Therefore, not all insects are able to transmit viruses. I well, that is a good thing. <laughs> yes, which is really good. <laughs> Okay, so we have many questions actually in the chat. So I'm going to uh, read out the next one. Uh, what are there, um, are there any sustainable earth friendly methods used to control the Latin fly? Yeah, so um, I, did, I did some reading uh, because we don't have spotted lantern fly here currently in California. So on UCIPM's website, there's not control measures because the insect is not here yet. Um, so looking at Cornell's website, they, they have traps and there's different types of traps. They're, they're sticky uh, tape that they go around the tree. Um, there's actual traps that you can create yourself, which are called these circular traps. Uh, they have information on their web pages on how to make them yourself. Uh, vacuum removal to, if there's a large population, get out there in a vacuum, but they do say you have to make sure 
um, not to leave them in the vacuum for too long because they'll start to die, they'll die and start to rot. And so you want to make sure you remove them out of the vacuum in a timely manner. Um, they have uh, insecticides on the East Coast. Um, and I won't go into the insecticides because in California, it's not here. And we're not going to say, hey, this insecticide works when it's not, um, we don't have that use yet approved because it's not here. They have it approved for, for emergency use in the East Coast because it's there. Um, and they're looking into biocontrol. There's different groups looking at the biocontrol options. Uh, there is uh, there is a um, parasitoid that was introduced in the early 1900s for spongy moth that they have found is parasit and it's an, you know it is parasitizing in very low percentage. I believe it was like about seven percent of the egg masses they were finding. Um, there are some predators, but the the predators are not able to keep the population under control. So it, yes, you'll have spiders that will predate or, or predatory stink bugs, but not to a, an extent that it actually reduces the population. Um, and then uh, entomopathogenic fungi, they're looking into that on the East Coast. So there's fungus that will attack insects and kill insects. Uh, and they have found some Bovaria species that have attacked immature and adults um, and caused death of those insects. So the research is ongoing, um, but there, they, there are some options out there. And I think following up on that, DeWitt had a question. He, he was asking about what control measures are available, which you just uh, spoke about. But he also asked, can the Chinese parasitoids be obtained? And are, or would those be useful or are those going to create other issues? So in 2019, Mark Hoddle, who is a researcher at UC Riverside, did get uh, proactive uh, research funds, uh, which was, I think, the first that I've ever heard of it, um, which is a great idea, in my opinion. Um, usually an insect arrives uh, and then um, it's already here. We don't have any control measures. And then we start um, importing the parasitoids. And there's a lot of testing that needs to be done to make sure those parasitoids won't attack to our native species. Um, and that usually takes an easily eight years uh, before, it, if, it, if it's shown to be um, not attacking our native species, it can be released. So in 2019, Mark Hoddle started this work. Um, looking at the, the effects of these two parasitoids um, that are native to China uh, that do keep this insect um, under control. And he's, he's also, um, in reading up on what his lab is doing, is also looking at the possibility of some other native parasitoids and seeing if those could be reared and, and used for control. So yes, it is, it's hard, it's hard, um, so if an insect's not here, if an insect is invasive and it's not in California, it's very hard to do research on it. And the reason being is that it has to be in a quarantine facility, which is extremely expensive, um, but it's a high tech facility that helps ensure that that insect is not gonna get out. Um, so it's not as easy to do research on an insect that is not currently here. Um, that's why it is a lot easier for Penn State and Cornell to conduct this research because they can do it in a regular lab. They have that insect present already there in that state and in that county. Makes sense. Um, so somebody asked if you have a photo of the damage, they seem to think it, it's pretty severe. Do you have a photo of them damaging a grapevine? So the damage is not the, the feeding penetration. So it's mm -hmm. not that it, puts its silent in and then now creates like some kind of sore, some kind of issue with the plants. It is the amount of feeding um, and they're, they are taking, ingesting all of the, the carbohydrates, you know, that you have in your phloem. Then the, the plant itself is not able to translocate that to the roots. So then it's not cold hardy. Then it doesn't have enough energy the following season to push. Um, and then it's not able to produce. And if you have so many insects feeding on a vine, 
um, it can cause the vine to collapse and die because it has no more, you took all of its nutrients, right? Um, so it's not that you, it causes a canker or a wound that doesn't heal. It has to do with what they're feeding on. They're taking all of its nutrients, the vine's nutrients. This is more internal damage than you're seeing it from the outside. So that's interesting yeah. because that was something I wanted to ask you is you mentioned that this insect can actually call, cause vine dieback, which, you know, you don't often see. And I was wondering how that actually happens. So, so that's the answer. Okay. Well, they, so they produce so much honeydew. So you think of like a mealybug, they have the same mouth parts, right? They have a stylet. Yeah. But think about how small a mealybug is and how much honeydew that they can produce. Now imagine something that's an inch, imagine an inch long mealybug and then hundreds of inch long mealybugs feeding on the vine, how much they're ingesting and affecting the ability of that vine to um, be able to overwinter, be able to push the next year. There's no, there's not enough carbohydrate storage to be able to, to do that. So the vine eventually can't keep up. So given that kind of damage though, if, if, uh, if you were to have that kind of damage and then eradicate the the moth would the vine come back or once it's damaged like that it's never coming back i haven't read anything specifically on that i think there comes a point though when a and when there's not enough carbohydrates for the vine to bounce back you know if you don't if you're not able to push leaves then you're not able to photosynthesize you're not you're not able to make photosynthates you're not able to make more sugar to translocate to the roots. Um, so at some point, there's gotta be a critical point in which there, there is no return. Gotcha. Uh, this is a, a question from uh, Philippe. Uh, will pheromones be a possible mating disruption for this organism? So I have not heard, I've not read anything about uh, pheromones. Not all insects use pheromones. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure whether there are ones for this insect or not. I have not read anything um, about that specifically, unfortunately. Um, some insects use pheromones and when they do, we can really use that against them, <laughs> you know, as far as control measures, but not all insects do. And so um, I'm not sure, I don't have an answer for that one. Okay. So Colin asks, what's the flight or dispersion range of this um, insect? So they can hop and they can fly. They're not great flyers, but they can, they can supposedly hop really well. Um, and they're three to four miles is a dispersal range that, that is being documented on the East Coast. That's far. That's scary. Especially given the range of hosts that you outline that are in California, pretty much from the southern end to, you know, the northern end of grape growing regions, it pretty much covers all of that within probably a couple miles, right? But they've also find populations that say are on corn um, and corn's not a host, but they will feed just long enough to have enough energy to continue going to find a host. So they will feed on plants that are not great hosts or not even considered hosts temporarily just to get enough food to be able to continue moving to find um, something that is. Um, so there's been quite a few, corn was one of them that I can remember, but there's quite a few crops that aren't considered one of their hosts that they've been found on for short term. Um, but they they have to feed it at least, um, they cannot feed, sorry, they cannot, uh, survive by not feeding over 48 hours. So, so they have to feed at least every two days, like they have to find a host. And if they don't, then they die. Um, so that's one of our benefits in control. Uh, 48, you know, 48 hours is, is a pretty short period of time, but they can bypass that a lot because they have such a huge host range. So yeah. they can move from it plant to plant. So uh, Morgan has a question. Um, what's the best way to rid one's property of tree of heaven? I have to say, as someone who's more of a fermentation person, um, I don't know what tree of heaven is anyway. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about tree of heaven, where it originally comes from, where it is now, 
and and then address Morgan's question of how do you get rid of it from your property if that's possible. Yeah, so Tree of Heaven, I believe, is also originates in, in Asia, um, and uh, and it's been here. I want to say since. If I remember correctly, something like the 1700s, or it's, I mean, a long time ago that Tree of Heaven was brought to the US. And um, I find it in California all the time in my North Coast. Uh, you guys have it in Davis near, near uh, P uh, Puda Creek. Uh, it's all full of Tree of Heaven. Um, and this, this is not an easy tree to get rid of. So, uh, I do have an article on my page, ucnr.com uh, forward slash um, NCIPM for North Coast IPM. And if you're on the left-hand side, you under Spider Lanternfly, there's Tree of Heaven. And I have an article that shows photos of how do I ID Tree of Heaven? Because there's a lot of lookalikes. So that's something to really, there, there's ways of IDing um, Tree of Heaven. It looks a lot like black walnuts, one of the ones sumac is another one that's often confused with tree of heaven so i have really good photos and step by step of how do id yes this is tree of heaven first of all um so you're not removing something that isn't actually a host uh and then tree of heaven you can't just cut it down when you cut it down <clears throat> it sends up runners and it will send up runners up to 50 yards from the original tree so you basically end up with a grove of tree of heaven if you just cut it down and don't do anything else. Um, so what is recommended is that you have to wait to a certain time in which, uh, to, to, in which the sugars are being translocated to the roots. And so it's, a, it's later in the season, and I have this in that article that I've written, um, in which it is cut, it, when you're applying a systemic herbicide and then you're able to cut and you have to come back the following year. So it's a timing thing of a sequence of what you need to do. And if you don't follow it, it's gonna be a bigger problem than what you started with. So it's very important. Um, this is a very, th this is the tree that, that grows and in, in cracks in the sidewalk. Uh, and, and actually behind me, my photo, that's tree of heaven. So this is the female. So they have female and male uh, plants. The female uh, produces hundreds of thousands of, of uh, seeds. And those seeds are shaped in a way that they can be carried in the wind. Um, and so it's important to make sure that if you're gonna go down that route, that you really investigate how to do it properly so that you don't have a bigger problem. Another thing, is that there, some people are allergic to tree of heaven. Um, and actually there are some medical issues related. You should always wear gloves and proper PPE when handling tree of heaven um, because there has been uh, some issues uh, health related by handling it too much. So Cindy, you mentioned something during your presentation about that the honeydew could potentially impact rape quality. So I wondered if there's, and it made me immediately think that of something like the mama rated stink bug, you know, where if you have a little bit of the stink bug included, your whole wine can be stinky, right? And, and smell and taste like it. So is there something about the honeydew that is off-putting? So the honeydew is a substrate for sooty mold to grow. And it's the sooty mold that causes off characters in the wine produce, um, like, like millibugs you know, you get sooty mold. Um, <clears throat> but there, I believe there are studies underway on the East Coast. Well, what if you get a spotted lanternfly in your bin of grapes? How many spotted lanternflies does it take to ruin my bottle of wine? Um, and well, we've looked at that with stink bugs, right? With brown marmaid stink bug. Um, because Tree of Heaven does, uh, is, is bad tasting in the sense that when they ingest tree, tree of he heaven, when they feed on tree of heaven, uh, birds have been shown to spit out uh, spotted lanternflies after they tried to feed on them because they are distasteful. And it, and it comes from, um, I don't remember the chemical compound off the top of my head that tree of heaven produces, um, but it is something that helps protect the insect from predators if they've been able to feed on that tree. 
Um, so it's probably like alkaloids or some something along that lines. Um, and so that is another area that needs to be looked at is, well, how many in a bin does that, you know, does it take to have off characters if they fed on tree of heaven, that is. So actually, Brad had a question, are they attached by light? I'm not sure what he's talking about. Does that make sense to you? Or should we get him to uh, expand a little bit? Are they bit attracted the to light? Oh, maybe that's it. Yes, that's what that's what he's asking. Are they attracted I, by light? I don't know. I don't have I don't know about that. I haven't read about light attraction. Some insects are, and that tends to be insects that are nocturnal, moths, for instance, that are nocturnal. This insect is not nocturnal, but I don't know if it has a known attraction to light. So someone wrote in the chat that. They are not attracted to light. You tend to find that in nocturnal insects. Yeah. So attracted during the day. Yeah. That yeah. That they'd be attracted to the light. Um, somebody also put in the chat that the compound that you were thinking of may be alentherm. Alentherm is a a lilopathic chemical produced by the Alenthus altissima tree which inhibits the growth of other plants. So that sounds like a possibility. I know that, that it does produce it um, in, in the ground and so then it outcompetes uh, native species of plant of mm. trees. So when you have a um, uh, tree of heaven growing, you'll tend to have stands of the tree of heaven and nothing else growing um, in that area. Yeah. So it sounds like this chemical is a good uh, is a good candidate, definitely. That that's just the one that's in the tree. Um. So, what do you think? You know, heaven but it arrives, and we have this in California. What's going to be the repercussions? It depends. Uh, early detection can help with eradication efforts. But if it's not detected early and establishing populations are able to reproduce um, to, to a hefty population, then it is an insect that we will have to deal with um, as along with like vine millibug and other insects that we um, have had introduced uh, to California. Uh, it would increase pesticide applications. Uh, there are pesticides being shown on the East Coast that are effective. Uh, but but there's such a high population coming from the wooded areas uh, in droves that they have to keep reapplying. And so in the end, that means more pesticides in our in our environment and soils. And it also means higher costs for grape producers to be able to still produce the product they're trying to produce, meaning our wine will cost more. Um, so there, there, there is... Um, we don't want this insect here. Um, I'm hoping that the research that's being done on biocontrol can produce some uh, a biocontrol agent that we could use and release and maybe establish. Um, but it's early on in that research process, too early to say, um, the results are very promising. I, I'm not sure, but it would be nice. I, I do like how, you know, there's groups looking at entomopathogenic fungi. So Bo Bovaria bassiana and different, different um, strains of Bovaria to be able to use that possibly as a control measure. Again, this is, you know, using fungus to attack the insects. There are a lot of options, but those options will cost money. So we don't want this insect here, you know? <laughs> we have enough problems already. Yeah. I think uh, we're gonna take a quick break here um, to hear some announcements from Karen. Um, and then after, Please feel free to keep putting questions in the chat uh, and we'll get back to Cindy in just a second. And I think that Caroline was also gonna share a poll once I do these announcements. So we have a couple of upcoming uh, programs. Our first one is on March 19th um, in Fresno and, and 
the, uh, it's one of our on the road programs. And we have another one coming up on April 10th in Bakersfield. And you can see these programs on the, um, on our department webpage, which is wineserver.ucdavis.edu. Oh, she, look at that. Caroline's already got them there in the chat as I was about to read out the links. Um, and then we have um, April 17th, we'll have Emerging and Future Challenges in Viticulture. It's gonna be, that one is actually gonna be a virtual program. Um, and that the information for that will also be, and she has it there in the chat already for all you guys as well. And then what we wanted to do really quickly before we answer the last questions is if uh, we have a poll, and I think that Caroline is gonna share the poll. There it is. Should be up there. Yep, it is up there. So if you just take a minute to answer that, we'd really appreciate that. So while you're doing that, please, again, feel free to, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so feel free to um, put more questions in the chat. Um, I, was, I was wondering, Cindy, and I, I guess this is kind of a hypothetical thing, but given, you know, the previous experience with invasive species, invasive insects um, in California, knowing where this uh, moth is right now. Um, what are the what are I mean? You you talked about some ways that it might inadvertently get to California. What what are the chances that it will? And also, what are the chances that the solutions that people in let's say Pennsylvania or New York are coming up with are going to work well in California? Oh, I think you're muted, Cindy. So the first part of the question, let's let's say in, in ways it has arrived. Um, it has been found dead in hulls of planes coming from the East Coast. So it's arrived dead, adults in hulls of planes. Um, it has been intercepted at the Truckee CDFA station on firewood that was being uh, trucked from the East Coast, egg masses. It has been found um, again, Truckee Station, um, CDFA Station on uh, metal plates used for construction, egg masses. So in Truckee, technically that CDFA Station is in California. You have to already have crossed the border for some time to get to it. Yeah. So technically it has been intercepted. Um, and it's just a numbers game. You know, CDFA is doing the best they possibly can, but it's a numbers game. You know, it's there's that we have ports, we have shipping ports, we have ports, the um, international um, airports, uh, people traveling, bringing, you know, moving family from Philly, Philly, bringing in, you know, they're moving across, they got a new job in California. And they're not checking their outdoor patio furniture for eggs or, or their kiddie pool or things that you wouldn't think of, right? And they're still transporting all of that. Um, so does that mean it's already here? Um, there has been no documented uh, population. There's been no documented, documented live finds outside of the, the, these ports of entrance in which they've been stopped. Um, but it should be said that it has made its way into California before and been stopped, right? Um, and, and so it's just a matter really of time. Um, you can do the best that you can, but it only takes one egg mass in theory. Um, so in, the, in, in being in the right situation, the eggs are at the right stage you know, because they overwinter as eggs. So, you know, the movement would have to happen at a time in which the eggs would be viable. Um, and that's where it's a little scary, you know. Um, that's why it's important to put out the information, uh, show people that are out in the field, like, this is what it looks like. And then if you see this, this is what you do about it, um, to help us prevent this. Um, in, in some ways, we're a little lucky that it, you know, arrived on the East Coast. 
uh, European grapevine moth was found first in the US in Napa. <laughs> it was directly right into the prime spot of where it could be um, to, you know, to, to, to flourish. Luckily, there was a quick response and eradication efforts um, were successful. Eradication efforts are not always successful. Um, and so, at least in this period of time, we are learning as much as we can. But you're right, is that what we learn in Pennsylvania is not necessarily always going to work here in California. We have different temperature and humidity and, and climate conditions. We have different crops. Um, so until it's here, we really don't know. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's something to pull from. It's better than pulling from no- It's better from starting from zero. Yeah. Um, you know, but yes, I think that there'll be some things that might work on the East Coast that when we would go to try here, it would not be as effective. But it also could go the other way where other things could be more effective um, because we just have the right climate for it to be. Um, that's hard to predict. So I think related, uh, Stan put a question in the comments. He's He's asking, are there any birds or other animals that will eat the lanternfly? So birds will eat spotted lanternfly. They have um, talked about if the spotted lanternfly has fed on tree of heaven, <coughs> they're seeing that the birds don't like them and they'll spit them out. Um, but that they are palatable when they haven't fed on tree of heaven. The problem is all it takes is a bird to feed on one that is fed on tree of heaven once to never do it again. It's the same kind of concept with the monarch butterfly, right? The monarch butterfly are very distasteful to um, predators. And so it only takes them once of trying it to never ever, not only, um, not only not feed on a monarch, but also the viceroy, which it mimics the monarch, right? So it gets that protection that way. Um, mammals have a memory and they don't want to go after something that tastes bad again. <coughs> yeah, it seems to me like part of the reason why we still don't have it is that fact that you talked about that they need to feed every 48 hours and people traveling from across the state, this is why sometimes they, at least they arrive dead. And yeah. Not viable. Yes, but if it's in winter time in which it's, they're all overwintering its eggs, those eggs don't need to feed. And that's mm -hmm. where you really um, are, are concerned of the, the egg masses coming in. The adults, okay. I agree. You'd have to come on plant material, right? You'd, you'd, and that's a lot, it's a lot easier to notice when that insect is on plant material that's going across. Sure. The so but, Brad, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna say Brad, and this is related to, I think what you're talking about. Uh, Brad put in a comment that we need to set up an oversight program to look for and report the lantern fly like Penn State's program. Is, it, is that something that exists? I know you're talking about everybody should be on the lookout for this and report it immediately, but is there a formal program for doing that? There is not a formal program like that mimics Penn State's. Um, but our program that we have in the state of California is to submit to the, your ag, local ag commissioner's office. Your local ag commissioner is the one that would send off samples to CDFA for final verification and then design a plan according to, to whatever they want to do in that county. Um, so it's not, you know, Penn State would be a larger program what we have in place now is each ag commissioner um, would, depending on where you find it, <coughs> what county. Yeah, the county programs. Yeah. So we have a question from Philippe about how long does it take for egg to hatch? So they overwinter as eggs. Um, I have I would have to look up the exact amount of days but it's an overwintering stage. So it would be largely driven by temperature. Um, a lot of insect development is driven by temperature. For instance, I'm rearing out flathead boar larvae, right? I had to mimic winter by putting them in the fridge. Now I'm taking them out and they're not supposed to pupate until spring. Um, so like 
later spring, like in April, May, but I already got them to pupate. And the reason being is temperature. I have them on a heating pad and I have the heater on them and I'm keeping them warm. I'm mimicking springtime. So <clears throat> um, the reason why they don't emerge, they're capable of emerging earlier if it, had, if it was springtime temperatures. So they stay uh, in the egg stage until springtime temperatures come around and it starts warming up and that they hit, they hit a threshold of whatever their degree day needs are um, to be able to emerge, if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense to me, yeah. I, so it's not the same as an insect that has multiple generation where it's like, okay, well, at 80 degrees, you know, it takes, you know, 30 days because the fact that they're overwintering and it's only one generation a year that they have on the East Coast. Um, and that, that, that might to, change here. Yeah, that, that's actually a question that Melanie just put into the chat is, yeah. so in our milder climate, could we possibly have year round infestation? It's possible, especially in areas that don't have freezing temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> or there could just be um, a shorter period in which they overwinter. Uh, since the, <clears throat> we get warmer earlier, uh, and we stay warmer later than say the East Coast. So that, that overwintering winter part of the eggs could be shorter, which could then uh, possibly support more than one generation in the field season. Not necessarily, but this is possibility. And this would be something that we would have to pay attention to. Like mealybugs in certain regions have more, you know, you go to a warmer area, they have more generations than in a cooler area. People uh, are putting a lot of interesting info in the chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Somebody, Brad, mentioned elevation will play a big role in California as well. Yep. Elevation. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of the elevation has, has more to do with temperature. Yes. Uh, so your temperature differences are going to be different. Um, and so that, again, temperature is one of the biggest drivers for insect development. Um, and so as you go higher in elevation, you're going to have um, a different weather than you would have, say, on the ground floor or the valley floor here in the north coast. Yeah, freezing. Absolutely. Above. Yeah, obviously, you, it's colder at higher elevation, more extreme temperatures and things like that. Um, which but may or may not help you. I suppose we won't know until the problem is here, which we don't right. want. Yeah, but we know that they can survive in, you know, New York and Pen Pennsylvania winters as eggs. So the adults die off, but the eggs can survive. And we know that. And so we know that they can survive, eggs can survive freezing temperatures. Yes, which are not good news because no. we don't aim for California to have those temperatures. This is why half of us live here. Um, I'm counting myself. Um, so I wanna say it's one minute before two. Yep. And I didn't arrange with Dave who is closing, but I want to say, Cindy, this has been extremely informative. I really didn't know much about this spotted Latin fly other than the name and a few pictures until you've talked about it. And it's been great. And thank you for everybody for asking such wonderful questions because it really got the, the conversation going. And I learned a lot. I'm definitely not even close to an insect lover. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> unlike Cindy, I don't look forward to collecting or breeding them at all. <laughs> and Cindy, thank you for sharing your time with us when I know you're extremely busy and you didn't feel top shape today, but you did a brilliant job. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank me. you for my co-hosts and organizers for this event. It's always great. All I do is log on and say hi. <laughs> and again we want to thank all of the all of our partners in uh extension because without their support uh we wouldn't be able to do programs like this and certainly if you are part of an organization that might like to be a partner with us in extension please uh let karen 
uh, know, and she can help you with that as well. Yep. Thank you all for attending today. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Cindy.